evening, folks. It's Barry Chalmers, and if you're here, you know it's well, it's 6 to 8 Eastern Time Tuesday. That's me, First Amendment Radio. Our first guest, I got to tell you, uh, I've been in a way writing on his behalf because his behalf is getting absolutely screwed. All right, but I'm going to um, give you a quick intro. All right, in 74, something called uh, Gush Emunim was born. That's the settler movement. Uh, today, uh, 120 settlements later, these Jewish communities are blossoming, uh, blossoming. Yeah, right, except for the ones in Gaza and northern Samaria that are not blossoming. Um, nonetheless, he did a documentary. Uh, it's called The Awakening of Judea and Samaria. And in it, you will learn from those who have been engaged in this struggle to settle the land, well... They've done it because of their dedication, uh, well, to Eretz Israel, to basically uh, Yesha, Yehuda Shamron. Look, Ezra Ridgely produced the Heritage Project. Ezra, are you there? Hi, hi Barry. How you doing? Oh, I'm hanging in there, and I hope you are as well. Yeah, I am. And yes, uh, the Jewish Heritage Project... Uh, which is at the Jewish Heritage Project dot com, is really a site that uh, to highlight the rise of Jewish culture on the land at the cradle of Jewish civilization. So the latest documentary by the Jewish Heritage Project uh, is the Awakening of Judea and Samaria. And a couple of years ago, we had one called the Spring of Judea and Samaria. And now this is taken to a new level and sort of commemorates the 40th anniversary of Gush Emunim, the, the settlement movement. But it shows not only the struggle to begin the settle- settlements by the, hearing from those who started it all or helped start it all, but it shows what they've become to today um, and what these beautiful communities are looking like as they continue to grow um, and grow. Well, look, you be- said that you uh, interviewed... Uh, those engaged in this struggle to settle this land. Do I know any of them? Uh, you probably do know some of them. Daniela Weiss? Right. Okay. Uh, you probably know, at least, I don't know, you probably heard of the Levingers. Of course, Harav Cook, who started the movement. Levingers showed me around Hebron. I was an honored, well, Harav Levinger showed me uh, the holy sites of Hebron. So I do know him. And uh, Nadia Matar. You know I'm her. Sure you must know her. Yep. And, and maybe I have some not-so-known heroes that I consider heroes, such as uh, Rachel Zimmerman, who uh, was, she's featured in the film. Uh, actually, she was, uh, at one point, she was in India with her sort of guru. And uh, at that time, he said, well, you're Jewish. Why don't you join the Peace Now movement in um, in Israel because we... I take it she before. didn't like that idea. Well, no, actually, she did. She thought, oh, really? you know, she had to listen to her. So she went, and within, you know, just a short time, the Peace Now said, yeah, embraced her, and next thing you know it, she's in Hebron protesting the, the so-called Jewish occupation of Hebron in Beit Hadassah um, back uh, in the day. And... Uh, but at that time, some uh, women came out, religious women, and showed her that, see all these I- homes where Arabs are living? These are actually Jewish homes because they have a little spot for the masusa on every door, including the style of the roofs that are built are all Jewish styles. But the, Hebron, but the Jewish community of Hebron was actually massacred in 29, and the woman began to explain to her about our Jewish heritage because she really didn't have the heritage. And the next thing you know it, she's one of the founding five families of Itamar with her husband, who was actually wounded in a terror attack in Hebron. And uh, they now she has ten children, an organic dairy farm, um, you know, cows, uh, fruit. All right, vegetables. she'd be a good guest. Yeah, oh she'd yeah, very incredible story, incredible story. And, um, and it was dedicated people like that that really... Uh, laid the seeds and the foundations of the communities. You know, you did mention at the beginning, you know, there, was, there, are, there were setbacks, I mean, in Gaza, but you know what? At the right time, we'll be back. 
and uh, uh, it's going to be uh, quite a achievement to uh, reconstitute what was a very uh, successful uh, settlement. Well, Gush Katif in the north and the south were all very successful. Yeah. They developed Good. new, yeah, new the ways economic, to grow things. Yeah, in Gush Katif, their agricultural economic output was ten times greater per capita than all the other agricultural in Israel. In their last year before they were uprooted, they exported a hundred million dollars in fruits, vegetables, and flowers, uh, and most of which went to the European Union until it was all uh, taken away for, well, basically no reason. And, Ezra, uh, when we get finished, now I noticed that we share Lulu for books. Yes. Get my book. It, it's, it's called Bye Bye Gaza. Okay, yes. I was there week after week. I spoke to big crowds, too. Mm -hmm. One was 800 people in a, in a large auditorium. There was no waking them. Uh, the forces that wanted them out were just understood. See, part of the problem, I think, back then was they actually didn't believe it was going to happen. Oh, they and, believed. They well, believed. you know what? They, it, 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 well, it, they, they just, believed they didn't it would, properly. They believed it would be... They thought God would somehow, at the last moment, save them. All yeah. right? And yeah, that was a I, big that mistake. Mistake. Yes, that was, uh, I guess, a mistake, for sure. Um, that, What's uh, the name of my book? So, okay, I'll get it for you. I'll get it. I'm trying. I tried and my I, best. I also, Honestly, in my book, uh, Judea and Samaria, The Land of God, I have a chapter called Gaza, and I speak about what the, how glorious the communities were and what they achieved and the consequences afterwards and uh, that the people have suffered. You're saying uh, it became a site for missile launching? That's right, that's right. Nevedekalim, the capital city of two and a half thousand Jews in Gaza, Jewish capital, Jewish city, became a terrorist training camp after the uprooting. So, you know, and you know, the funny thing is, you know, Ariel Sharon, when he was campaigning his last election, he went to Gaza and said, you know, um, you know, our security starts with here in Gaza. That means like it's like a front line for security for the state of Israel. And he campaigned on that. So stuff like that, you know. Are you saying he lied deliberately? Well, you tell me. <laughs> well, I know the answer. <laughs> we know the answer. What happened is, okay, actually, no, that wasn't a lie. That was actually truth. Because afterwards, he did, when he uh, removed the communities of Gaza, his the security situation uh uh, got so bad that, as we know, it's still going on to this day. So, actually, when he said it was, um, we needed the communities for security, uh, he was right, and it helped him get elected, <laughs> helped him get lots of votes. It but helped he did him stand get up. assassinated. It probably, yes. Read or whatever my happened. book. Whatever That's I know, the actually, Omer, per Omer yeah. Paris uh, Covenant, and yeah. I use that word right now because we've got to go back Look, your arguments, and you sent me, uh, I believe, ten of them, yes. My list, of, by the way, I wanted you on for two hours, but something very big is happening on May 26th. Uh, the Pope is coming to, uh, to Israel, and the significance is way yes. big. Once again, some people are kind of waking up that there's behind the scenes a chicanery well, going on. Well, we're, as we're reading in the papers now, there's so, supposedly at work, you probably can know more than I would about, is there barely a secret deal to give the tomb of uh, King David to... No, the, it's not at all. The why deal are they is to all give, that? The deal is to give Mount Zion to the Vatican. Well, <laughs> that's like... So, um, like, how can they actually do that and think they're going to get away with it? Because they got away with Gaza. Well, Not only Gaza, they got away with northern Samaria. All gone. There's no more northern Samaria. They got away with Sinai. All gone. There's no Sinai. I think what are you talking about? The parameters of the government today are a lot different. I mean... You know, oh, the, really? makeup of, the makeup of uh, the government is not the same as it was those back then. When uh, nowadays, you know, with um, the Naftali Bennett party and, uh, and, and oh, I don't know, you know these 
they might uh, like I don't think he's going to support that if they, if something like that went through. I just don't, you know, I could be wrong, but I I just would it would be you such really scandal. It'd be a scandal. Underestimating the power of threats. You're underestimating the power of deadly, deadly blackmail. But I'm not. Well, <laughs> I well, know how you know that works. Yeah, but you know what? Time. I think that in a case like this, when you're talking about Jerusalem, the Holy oh, yeah? City, in the Old City, bas- well, basically, um, you're and talking about... The Temple Mount is not banned to Jews. It wasn't handed over. It was handed Washington over, but now, but now there's a tide rising, you know, in recent years, especially Moshe Feglin has been... Uh, Sort of uh, leading the charge a little bit. In so they almost weeks. killed his son. It was a very close call. Yeah, if you, you understand, that, you think that was on purpose? You think that uh, I never heard oh. that uh, idea from you or Ezra, uh, Ezra, Ezra. Okay, I've gone through. <coughs> oh, I personally seen what they can do. I yeah, know, I know you've had still... suffered. I know you've suffered because of it, because of what you uh, do. The work you do. Uh, yes, I think it was deliberate. Yes, I think Faglin has been bought and sold as a border he can't cross. Yes. Do you think he understands that uh, what you're saying, that this is what I happened? think he knows it perfectly he knows well. It. He's a pretty smart guy. He just he was in here Toronto last week and um, actually took a video of him. I posted it on YouTube uh, and he was giving his, you know, um, plan for the future as he sees it and... Um, he seemed to pretty. Where's he moving to Australia? <laughs> well, he's hopeful that uh, there's a future for Israel, and that despite uh, all the problems, he has a plan. In fact, today his five-point plan for, you know, uh, sovereignty over Judea and Samaria. Uh, you know how he would implement it if he was the uh, the president or the prime minister of Israel. Oh, and, listeners, uh, I have to say this. My book, Bye Bye Gaza, is at lulu.com, www.lulu.com. Chammer, C-H-A-M-I-S-H is my name. Bye Bye Gaza. And let's counter some of... Look, don't get me wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ezra is, is no dummy, but my God, are you optimistic. Well, I just think that um, the conditions... In the nation, in whether the religious movement and even in the government are not the same if they attempted, let's say, to uproot um, the communities. But let's say if they could make a deal. You're thinking that literally when, let's say, uh, the Pope is here, they would sign that deal? Oh, well, I'd say it's already signed. But it would be secretly. It's all done in secret. Is that uh, what you're you bet it's secret, but nonetheless, um, the Sephardic rabbi has announced the government has tried to force him to logically hand over Mount Zion. Really? Uh, uh, look, this isn't small stuff. Major. Oh, it's major stuff, of course. This is like handing away. It's, it's like denying the Torah. It's like telling the Jews, don't worry. <laughs> like, you know, if God gave us his land and covenant, which I believe he did. And All right, let's December, do that. You know, what does that mean? My listeners... Now, you have to understand, we're now going to make things easy. What is a land covenant? Let's start with that. It starts with, it goes back a a little over three and a half thousand years ago with Abraham, the father of the Jewish people. When uh, God sent him into the land, he said, go to the land, I'll show you. And he came into the land, uh, which is where Judea and Samaria is today. And he stopped uh, at Shechem by Elan Moray, which is near Palestinian Nablus. And there God spoke to him and said, To your descendants, I will give this land. And when we follow the pathway, this was up in the Shamron, in Samaria, uh, near two mountains, Mount Grizim and Mount Eval, was all there. And now if you just took that and then go, uh, go ahead in history, you know, we have the 12 tribes of Israel, they go to Egypt, they are... Um, they come out enslaved. of Egypt, they get the Torah, they're enslaved, they get the Torah. They, now Joshua's in charge, they're coming along the Promised Land, they're crossing the Jordan River, and where does Joshua take them? To the exact location where uh, God first spoke to Abraham and said, to your land, uh, I will give this ascendance. And Joshua... Jericho? 
No, no, actually, Jericho was the first nation conquered, but before they conquered Jericho, they actually, they went, it's not chronologically the book of, uh, the book of Joshua, and also in the Torah itself, God commanded, when you enter the land, you shall pronounce the blessings and the curses on Mount, uh, uh, Grizim and Mount Eval. So it was a commandment to take the children of Israel. And Joshua took up the Jordan Valley. Before, even, even though Jer- Jericho was there, when they crossed the Jordan, they went up the Jordan Valley, uh, and if you, right around the Turtsa Valley, where the present day settlement of Elan Mare, mentioned the Torah, and there is Har Grizim and Har Eval. So Joshua took the entire camp of Israel, and it's written, the women and the children, and there he carved a repetition of the Torah in stone on Mount Eval. This is, uh, and then he... Oh, wait a uh, minute, there was no Torah. Yes. This not is at, not in the yet. Wilderness. No, they, no, no, they, after, no. In, when there they were the out, commandments. Mo, Mo, no, Moses, yes, there was a Torah. There was more than just the Ten Commandments. Moses received the Torah in the wilderness. I mean, he may receive the commandments, but if you read the books, while they're still in the wilderness, they're receiving all these laws about purity and all these other laws about, you know, this and that. And uh, they were compiled during the 40 years in, in, in a book as we know it. But Moses received all that from God when he went up onto the mountain. Well, but that the, Ten would Commandments, be the first book of the Torah. Uh, after that comes, like, you know, David and, and well, a steady downfall. Yeah, and Yeah, the five books of the Torah, like, you know, um, you have um, Bereshis, or okay, let's say in English, Genesis and Exodus and, and Leviticus and Numbers. And Deuteronomy, which is Devarim. And um, those are the five books which make up the Torah, so this, in the Torah scroll. But after that comes, you know, then the Tanakh sort of takes over, and we have Joshua. But when Joshua went up there, to the very place where God promised to Abraham, I'll bring you descendants, um, there they affirmed the covenant of the Ten Commandments in the Torah in the land, and said, God, we will keep your commandments and, there, and they went up on the mountain. He went on the mountain. And actually, six tribes, it says, six tribes stood on one hill among Grisim and six on the other. And he pronounced the blessings and the curses. A lot of them had to do, the blessings would be, blessed are those who, um, you know, um, observe all the words of this Torah. Or a lot of them were, blessed are those who don't uh, commit certain forms of immorality. And the, there would be a, a corresponding counter curse. Ble- cursed is those who does that. So, and they in six tribes on one hill, six on the other. And basically, at that time, we first had to acknowledge to God that we would keep His Torah in the land. Now we are ready to go and conquer the land. And now they return back to Gilgal by Jericho, and they're ready to start conquering the land. But first, God, they had to affirm to God that they would follow His commandments, because God was expelling the nations um, of the land because of their immorality and. Uh, all their other debased activities, uh, which is why God had to throw them out, because the land was holy. Even Jew, Jewish people there or not, it's still holy land. And um, all right, yeah. so uh, I didn't know this. You're saying, well, Joshua didn't go into Shechem. He well, yeah, overlooked. He, actually, no. Actually, in those days, they totally when. Okay, actually, there's a story when Jacob. Okay, first we have Abraham, we have Isaac, and then Isaac had. Uh, uh, his son Jacob he had two sons Jacob and Esau and Esau was going to kill uh, Jacob and he fled to Haran the place where Abraham came from and when he returned he married Rachel and Leah and two other um, wives and then when he came back with his t- ten children actually ten sons and a, eleven actually eleven sons and a, da- and a daughter uh, Dina they stopped at Shechem uh, and it says that Jacob bought a parcel of land. So first Jacob bought the parcel of land where Abraham, God promised Abraham to give it to him. And it says before Shechem, he bought a parcel of land. And basically the family of Jacob was the first West Bank Jewish settlement. And at that time, the sons of Jacob, because they, Dina, their sister was raped, they went and slew the, 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 the men of Shechem, killed all of them. And Ooh, uh, nasty story. Yeah, it was a nasty for one, story. For one rapist, they killed everybody? Well, uh, Jacob was very angry with it. He cursed... Uh, he the, must well, have been more. Yeah, so he was furious, obviously, because they had a high moral standard to them. This was, like, so reprehensible, uh, they couldn't re- restrain their indignation. But never, nevertheless, Jacob still cursed their anger just before his death for what they did. And... Uh, 
they had to flee the area. And well, they, listen, we have a few minutes before we have to take off for uh, oh, three minutes of commercials. Uh, you have a book. Just tell people how to get your book and what it's called and all that. Okay. So the book is called Judea and Samaria, The Land of God. You can purchase it at lulu.com, L-U-L-U dot com. And just put uh, in the search box, you can put just Judea and Samaria, and it'll be the first one to pop up. And the book has to do with the, not only the rise of Jewish culture in the land of Judea and Samaria, the settlements, and, but it also gets into the early establishment of the state and also four reasons why um, they, the... The Arabs have no right to the land from a legal, Ooh. historical, legal, historical, a moral, and a religious rights. So anybody could be a perfect advocate uh, for the people of Israel, uh, based on what I wrote in that not book. Not the Arabs; they're going to be really no. Shit. They're not going to like it, but they, it's <laughs> so factual. They have to see. They exist on lies and good propaganda, and we well, have that's to not have the truth. Here. We have to be no, no. I'm just it's truth, and we have to <laughs> well. use the truth, but we need good propaganda with the truth and Israel is their own worst enemy in previous years but they're, they're, it's getting better when it comes to their propaganda for you know getting oh, the truth out oh. there and uh, so the book goes on and covers other things including the redemption of the Jewish people a special chapter on the Holocaust called um, the Jews the sacrificial nation and I want to say that there's no other book anywhere in the world sacrificed by labor Zionism no no they call it there's no other book that covers the Holocaust from a viewpoint that, it, that I have written about it uh, as it is in that book. And it will astound everybody. And, um, Unless and, it's what I've written in yeah. many, many times in but my book. No, but your, your perspective is you're talking about maybe um, a different thing. Like Even though it's the same topic, you, I'm looking at from the point of view of the span of Jewish history, the Jews accepting the Torah, and the why did God allow this to happen and the consequences, the results – and the the end result and all this other stuff. And believe it or not, I turn a positive spin on it because... Uh, I believe it. I believe it. Because ultimately, um, God will redeem uh, the Jewish people despite um, all the things that have happened to us throughout history because we've been involved in elevating humanity for the last 2,000 years. I am now going to quote Ezra uh, Ridgely. Uh, oh, did this counteract... I didn't even understand it, all right? The okay. settlers are doing good because it's a sin against those who perished in the Holocaust if you don't back them. Now, here are your words, all right? Okay. And I'm finding them confusing, but you take off from here. I'm going to quote you. The okay. violence had caused Britain to renege on the responsibility, according to the mandate, to deliver this land to us as a nation. When 1939 came, there was no homeland for the Jewish people to flee to. Three million Jews or more could have been saved from the Holocaust. It would be morally reprehensible that the people who contributed to their death should inherit the land meant for them. Now, I would say that means labor Zionism, but you have a different interpretation, and I... I'm going to let you do it, even though, okay, if you know I, anything. You know, I'm looking this from a perspective of a na Britain, who was, were the guardian after 1917, they became the new guardians of the Holy Land. And in 1920, this is all on my book, in 1920, in April 1920, the Allied powers of World War I got together uh, in San Remo, Italy, and they decided that uh, they would back up the mandate for Palestine, which the British government said to Lord Rothschild, his is His Majesty's favor that there should be a Jewish homeland in Palestine. And so in 22, it was ratified, and they, because uh, written in the mandate for Palestine, that Israel had a historic connection to the land, and that they can establish a state in Palestine. And Britain was mandated to deliver this land to the Jewish people, and they agreed upon it in all those who signed the League of Nations. But Britain... As I told my friend Dr. Hanoch, who cares what a bunch of British imperialists said? Well, who says anything they said or did was legal? Okay, but, okay, but this is what happened, though. So, in those pre-state years, what was wait, going on? Wait, wait, you didn't answer that. Who said anything the British imperialists uh, did or said for Palestine was legal. Um, Just the British imperialists and the Jews. 
It's okay. a big problem here. Okay, technically that's okay. That, okay, well, if you're uh, operating, let's say, under the premise, and and I can, in a way, agree. Was the League of Nations? Who are they that they could make? And maybe Britain was, you know, they're the new power people on on the planet with it, and they, uh, you know, help create, I guess, the League of Nations, and they, um, and you know, certain nations signed them to be part of it. I believe there was 51 of them, including Japan, believe it or not. And uh, so, okay, so they agreed that Israel could have this land. So, okay, whether we want to recognize the legal authority, nevertheless, these nations did make a, an affirmative uh, voice saying the Jews can have Palestine and many other nations that didn't sign it, uh, like America, but the Senate uh, acknowledged uh, the backing for it, um, that the Jews could have Palestine. So Britain... Okay, so if the nations make a statement, it's a statement. So they didn't give Israel the land. And now what happens is a lot of Arab terror uh, against Jews. It was a one-way street as usual because of Arab propaganda against Jews was happening, including, as we, I said, the, white, the extermination of the, the Jewish community of Hebron, which had been there for 700 years. So when Britain decided, what are we going to do about all this violence? They did the Peel Commission in 36 and 37. They came out with it. They said... We have a solution. We'll divide the land and give Judea and Samaria to the Arabs. And that was their solution, the ulti- ultimate appeasement of violence. They set the standard for what we, what's going on in the world to this very day, appease the violence. What was the with- date that they shut the borders to Jews? Okay. Um, on May 17th. Nine, okay, they were shutting. Okay, in, in 1930, they were restricting Jewish immigration for several years up until 39. And, but totally May, blocked. And it. then in eight, yeah, and then in, in, in 1939, on May 17th, came out the white paper, and basically uh, uh, the white paper uh, said um, it's um, it's no longer part of His Majesty's government that there should be uh, a, home, a Jewish homeland in Palestine. So they reversed it and outright proclaimed the idea that there will not be a Jewish homeland in Palestine. And when did World War II break out? Okay, this is what, if you give me about two minutes to spiel that, because it's what I want to get to. All there, right, get okay, to it. Okay, now you have the country that was mandated to give the Jewish people a homeland. Now the sign, hey, we're not going to do it. And, of course, all those other nations didn't protest that signed on the agreement either. So guess what happened? Three and a half months later, after they came out with their white paper saying the Jewish people will not have a homeland in Palestine and they won't be able to immigrate to the land, World War II broke out. Seven months later, in my opinion, this is a judgment of God, um, food rationing was in Britain because now a famine was starting because of the war. And in 14 months later, after Britain told the Jewish people they will not have a homeland, now the process of, the, of Britain having their homeland taken away from them was underway. London was being carpet bombed and Britain was, fu- uh, was fighting for their lives. And not only that, all those European nations who signed on to the, um, the League of Nations who said that the Jews could have a homeland, who didn't protest. What happened? Measure for measure, God raised up an evil nation who rolled across Europe and took their nations away from them in a measure for measure. And it wasn't until the war was over and 50 million people killed, then the European had a second idea that maybe the Jews do have a homeland. But it's a catastrophic judgment, in my opinion, uh, resulting because if God is truthful and he says I will bring my people back to the land and I will restore Israel and if it was in God's plan that it was a time to redeem the Jewish people and, and bring them back to the land if the world were to say no it's simply not going to happen well we have the same thing as happened in Egypt God will enact horrible judgments to alright enough people. of this but okay. <laughs> again you have to uh, yeah, you... say this didn't happen that's all I'm saying demographics of the army's changing and this is one of the big things that would be a major obstacle for them to do another Gush Katif uh, well, as an expulsion. And they, they, don't may view they may try, but I think that it's going to be more civil upheaval than they could have imagined because I don't think I that think it's going to be... Have, I don't think if the Jews of Gaza, of Gush Katif couldn't stand up for their homes watch them bulldoze well, and we, then of course were taken to hotels overnight and left I know homeless I know. 
I know, and I know. you're saying that they're company. going to stand up because they've had enough crap. Exactly, yes. We got a little microcosm of it, I guess, when they tried to uproot Amona. I still say they're a weakening bunch. Uh, the ones, the ones, the, the, the entities, uh, that are the contrary entities, whatever we want to call them, uh, they are a weakening bunch and they're losing their hold on the nation. And they, and they may know the that. They might go out with the last gas. They might go out with the last gas, possibly. But they're not going to succeed. Why? Because God, the God of Israel, gave this land to the Jewish people in a covenant. And I never finished my part about Joshua, but God gave the land, all the covenants, even Brit Milah, the covenant of circumcision, which is actually points to the land covenant, which we've been doing for three and a half thousand years, is based on the premise that God will give us the land. And that land is centered on in Judea and Samaria. And, you know, a little t- intriguing little point. You know how they have gematria. You know, uh, numerical values of similar phrases, they match up and point to something. You know, you take Brit Hashem. The covenant of God has the same numerical value. That means the Hebrew letter summing up as Yehuda Vishamran, Judea and Samaria. You know, it's like, this is the land where the covenants were made. It's where the Torah was played out uh, in the land that the Tanakh was played out. It's where our nation was born. It wasn't born in Tel Aviv. So today, in 120 communities, we have 370,000 Jews and 230,000 across the Green Line in so-called East Jerusalem, which is really, you know, North, East, and South. That's 600,000. That's how many mentioned were the armies in the Torah that came out of Egypt. It's 600,000 is how many established the state of Israel. And now, in a way, we have a new nation within a nation and it's 600,000 Jews in Judea and Samaria. So you're and, into Gematria, huh? Well, yeah, I, you, you, don't, you don't find truth from it, but it can back up truth. Well, or, no. You know, just intriguing. intriguing. The take, rabbis in ancient days used to use it a lot, but no, I'm not, I just... Take just, my name in Hebrew, Hamish. Yeah. What's the Gematria? What's the onomatopoeia? You tell me. You tell me. I don't know. Mashiach, of course. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> and Barry, of course, is Rabbi... Uh, my rabbi, mm-hmm. so my name in Gematria is my rabbi, the Messiah. Okay. Well, put it this way. It could be <laughs> you your... Me- <laughs> well, right. maybe your message is a forerunning message that the Jewish world needs to know before the Messiah comes. I mean, there's a lot of messages, but it's important that we know all the truths that are going on. And uh, But I still you're think... Right about, you're right about... But Judea and Samaria being the heartland of the Bible. But I want to quote, now, you have got a British census. I have used this. As a matter of fact, uh, a Muslim, Kevin Barnett, was on my show that the British census in 1864 found Jerusalem to be 80% Jewish. And, by the way, uh, similar majorities were in Tiberias and Sfat. But in Yesha, they're not there. Uh, you didn't have well, 80 percent. Ye- well, okay, in Yeshua, there were, weren't very many Arabs there. Um, if Mark Twain, in his book, um, he wrote that when okay. he, there was hardly anybody there because the land really was desolate. Why didn't you just think about where the location of Israel is? It's probably the most prime real estate in the world. They're all in Europe and Asia and all that, and, but it couldn't be settled really in any significant way by any culture or people for two thousand years because the land was so uninhabitable, as Mark Twain said, even the cactus didn't want to grow. So no, no peoples could migrate there and start an economy and grow things because the land just wouldn't give forth anything. And that's what God said, the land would lie desolate until the Jews return. When the Jews began to return, then the land began to bring forth um, fruit and vegetables and trees. And, and people could plant things and it would grow as long as they're Jews because... The blessing is for the Jews, not for the non-Jews, to grow the land. That's why when the, the, the Jews went to Gush Katif, for instance, the Arab, and it's a famous thing, I think I write it in my book about Gush, the Arabs told the Jews, well, don't worry, this is all sand, you can't plant nothing, the land's cursed. But guess what? The Jews were blessed, and they could grow things. Well, they put up greenhouses, and yeah, they grew still, the, God gives Well, them no, the, that was the know? secret. They're right, on the land they couldn't grow anything, but you put up greenhouses... And the sun, it worked, all right? You the know, greenhouses worked. Well, God gives the ingenuity and uh, to grow things to the Jewish people. 
And as you know, in Israel today, it's probably the only country in the world that's literally self-sufficient in food. In food, I mean, you can get apples and oranges in the, you know, like you can go to the Golan and get apples and pears, and then you can go like 50 kilometers south, and there's banana crops in like south of uh, Tiberias, you know, south of Kinneret. Like this is incredible. You get tropical fruit and winter fruit from winter countries in one little tiny piece of land. Only, like, this is uh, utterly amazing. Even the, the, the dates in Israel, the average date uh, palm tree produces something like 400% more dates. It's some, I don't know, some outrageous amount. All right. Than other date palms now, where is this leading? I don't believe Yesha uh, is known for agriculture. Uh, it I mean, now. who cares if they can grow an orange um, uh Outside of Yesha. It is. You just see the vineyards. It says in the prophets, God said, there will yet plant vines on the hills of Shamron, or on the hills of Samaria. So today, all over there, you've got the Shiloh winery, the Harbraka winery, you've got uh, the Givat Harel uh, winery. You've, they're growing wine. They're making uh, grapes. They're growing grapes on the hills of Shamron. A Piscot winery. They're growing the grapes. They're flourishing. And the pro- prophets... Uh, the prophecies of the Bible, which God said the mountains will grow grapes and drip with sweet wine, are now coming to true before our eyes. But only the Jews could do that. The grapes don't even, the Arabs, they don't even grow any grapes. They don't, I don't think they know how to. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they grow lots of olives, which is nice. But uh, olive trees... Well, uh, I've seen that growing. the Jews... Listen, uh, you write again these, your argument... And Israel, only nine miles wide at its most narrow point, and surrounded by 300 Arabs who want to destroy us. Um, uh, well, look, I heard the exact same arguments, and then the Sinai went. And by the way, the Sinai had agriculture, which had, I don't think it's ever been seen in places like Nueva and Dahab and Sharm el Sheikh and Yamit in the north. Yeah, the Jews made the Sinai flourish. And off it went. It's gone. It's now a terror home. Same with Gaza. Mm -hmm. So now you're saying the same thing. How on earth does this... There's a big... Well, you know, it's it's simply not the same because the land of Judea and Samaria Ah. is where we were born in the center of the covenants. And we have... You know, I always put God in the equation that the blessing in the 40 years that they survived uh, in Judea and Samaria and the quantity of Jews now living there... 600,000 um, in the 120 communities uh, in East Jerusalem and so forth um, is evidence that there, despite 40 years that the world has been going, uh, doing what they could to make Jews give up the land, they failed. The, most, the biggest failure of an organization in humanity is the Peace Now movement. They get little victories here and there and they get them, but overall they have failed to stop the progression and the expansion of Jewish... Eighty percent of Israel's gone. The Israel I moved to, you got on a bus, you went to the Sinai, you could breathe free. It, it's mostly gone. What are you that was talking all, no, about? No, I'm talking about Judea and Samaria, the settlement movement. That's all... The Sinai was signed away by the government, and yes. uh, and that was a, a bad thing. But, you know, that was in, what, 77, 78? So now, here we are... Um, 30, what, six years later, and, uh, but 40 years in the settlement oh, of Judaism, yeah. there, more than that. Nonetheless, you're celebrating nothing but defeats. No, six, I'm not. I'm celebrating 600,000 people across the Green Line. I'm celebrating 40 years of Jewish settlement life in Judea and Samaria, and 40 years, and 600, I explain why 600,000. How many more Jews would be there if there weren't building freezes? There would be, if there was no building freeze, there would be at least another million Jews there because so many Jews want to live there because of the religious and cultural lights in the land is the best part of all Israel. I mean, it, you, at nighttime it gets cool because of the high elevation. It's, it's a beautiful breeze. It's beautiful to look at the hills. Um, and, and yet so, the right-wing government of Israel is preventing Jews from moving absolutely. to Judea and Samaria. Now, that how do you explain that? Because they're not right, or they don't believe in God, or they're serving other entities, or oh, they're God. afraid, or they're capitulating to the other powers, because they, uh, they fear other powers, and they don't truly have the faith in what God. What if they are the other powers? 
this is what I've been trying to well, say. I'm not saying, no, so I'm not saying, like, there's a line that's crossed when they no longer begin to serve the interests of the Jewish people and they can begin to serve the interests of foreign nations. Then you can almost say, almost say, uh, that they're like the other, na- the powers that are, want to rule, rule us. However, right. they're not in total, but they're not in total control. And they are losing their power. And Netanyahu knows that. That's why he made Hebron. Uh, now he made it a Jewish heritage site in allowing schools to take their children to visit uh, Kevra Mechpelah and all that stuff. Because even he realizes that um, the tide is changing. And that... Oh um, you know, I want so you to know I wanted you on my show and I'm glad of this, by the way. Not necessarily uh, for reasons you would believe, but for... to. For other people, most of my listeners, I think, are not Jewish, to understand where the thinking comes from. Well, this thinking if, is keeping you going, but a lot of it is terrible. They, I, I think that if they read my book, and um, a, a lot of people told me that it was a book that doesn't agree with anything, disagree with anything the Christians follow, a believe, evangelical type that believe about the Jewish people and their destiny and their history, it will be a piece of information that they will love because it just uh, it shows that God is true. And you know what? The Christians also, or the non-Jews, have a stake in Israel because God created the nation of Israel to bring the world to God. And he said, my house is a house of prayer for all nations. So any investment that they do in the land of Judea and Samaria and helping the communities and the charities there or whatever, they are actually investing in their future also because no peace is coming to the world unless peace comes to Israel. And peace can't come to Israel until Israel has all of their land and occupying it and populating it. And this is the destiny of... All right, Ezra, the time has come for you. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. Uh, the t- I talk so much on these shows, I get clogged. Uh, tell me, come, tell okay. people the name of your book, where to get it, and what the Jewish Heritage okay. Project.com. Your website and your book. Tell okay. them all. Okay. At the Jewish Heritage Project.com, you can get two 60 minute documentaries The Spring of Judea and Samaria, The Awakening of Judea. Judea and Samaria, as well as another 50 small videos on on the Jewish settlements in Judea and Samaria. And there, under the heading books, you can get my, just click it and my book will pop up. There's a video of it and just go to lulu.com, lulu.com, and you can order the uh, Judea and Samaria, the land of God, and you'll be blessed. And share the JewishHeritageProject.com with all your friends and buy the book. Perfect. And, uh, thank you very That's much. That's right. You were a good guest. And I think thank you. my purpose, again, folks, this is the thinking, and it's very, very optimistic. Ezra, thank, thank you. Very you. Coming up with Steve Stavro to talk about the Pope coming to Israel in two weeks. We'll see you folks in seven minutes. Thanks, Ezra. Bye.